Chapter Five of Witching Hill by E. W. Horning. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Angel of Life. Copplestone was the first of our tenants who had taken his house through me, and I was extremely proud of him. It was precisely the pride of the mighty hunter in his first kill, for Copplestone was big game in his way, and even of a leonine countenance with his crested wave of tawny hair and his clear sunburnt skin. In early life, as an incomparable oar, he had made a name which still had a way of creeping into the sporting papers, and at forty-five the same fine figure and untarnished face were a walking advertisement of virtue. But now he had also the grim eyes and stubborn jaw of the man who has faced big trouble, he wore sombre ties that suggested the kind of trouble it had been, and he settled down among us to a solitude only broken in the holidays of his only child, then a boy of twelve, at a preparatory school. I first heard of the boy's existence when Copleston chose the papers for his house. Anything seemed good enough for the three reception rooms and usual offices, but over a bedroom and a playroom on the first floor we were an hour deciding against every pattern in the books, and then on the exact self-colour to be obtained elsewhere. It was at the end of that hour that a chance remark about the evening paper and the latest cricket led to a little conversation, insignificant in itself, yet enough to bring Copleston and me into touch about better things than house decoration. Often after that, when he came down of an afternoon, he would look in at the office and leave me his pal mal, and he brought the boy with him on the first day of the midsummer holidays. Ronnie's a keen cricketer at present, said Copleston on that occasion, but he's got to be a wet bob like his old governor when he goes on to Eton. That's what we're here for, isn't it, Ronnie? We're going to take each other on the river every blessed day of the holiday. Ronnie beamed with the brightest little face in all the world. He had bright brown eyes and dark brown hair, and his skin burned a delicate brown instead of the paternal pink. His expression was his father's, but not an atom of his colouring. His mother must have been a brunette and a beautiful woman. I could not help thinking of her as I looked at the beaming boy, who seemed to have forgotten his loss, if he had ever realised it and yet it was just a touch of something in his face, a something pensive and constrained when he was not smiling, that gave him also such a look of Copleston at times. But as a rule, Ronnie was sizzling with happiness and excitement, and it was my privilege to see a lot of him those hot holidays. Copleston did not go away for a single night or day. Most mornings one met him and his boy in flannels on their way down to the river, laden with their lunch, but because the exclusive society of the best of boys must eventually bore the most affectionate of men, I was sometimes invited to join the picnic, and on Saturdays and Sundays I accepted more than once. Those, however, were the days on which I was nearly always bespoke by Uvo Delavoye, and once when I said so, it ended in our all going off together in a bigger boat. That day marked a decline in Ronnie's regard for me as an ex-member of a minor school eleven. It was not, perhaps, that he admired me less, but that Delavoye, who played no games at all, had nevertheless a way with him that fascinated man and boy alike. With Ronnie it was a way of cracking jokes and telling stories, and taking an extraordinary interest in the boy's preparatory school so that its rather small beer came bubbling out of a sparkling brew that Copleston himself had failed to tap. Then Uvo could talk like an inspired professional about the games he could not play, about books like an author, and about adventures like a born adventurer. In Egypt, moreover, he had seen a little life that went a long way in the telling. Conversely, one always felt that he had done a bigger thing or two out there than he pretended. To a small boy, at all events, he was irresistible. Had he been an usher at a school like Ronnie's, he would have had a string of them on either arm at every turn. As it was, a less sensible father might well have been jealous of him before the holidays were nearly over. But it was just in the holidays that Copleston was at his best. 
When the boy went back in September, we were to see him at his worst. In the beginning he was merely moody and depressed, and morose towards us, too, as creatures who had served our turn. The more we tried to cheer his solitude, the less encouragement we received. If we cared to call again at Christmas, he hinted, we should be welcome, but not before. We watched him go off bicycling alone in the red autumn afternoons. We saw his light on half of the night. Late as we were, he was always later, and now he was never to be seen at all of a morning. But his grim eyes had lost their light, his ruddy face had changed its shade, and ere long I saw him reeling in broad daylight. Copleston had taken to the bottle, and, as a strong man takes to everything, without fear or shame. Yet somehow I felt it was the first time in his life. So did Delavoye, but on other grounds I did not believe he could have been the man he was when he came to us, if this curse had ever descended on Copleston before. Yet he seemed to take it rather as a blessing, as a sudden discovery which he was a fool not to have made before. This was no case of surreptitious, shamefaced tippling. It was a cynically open and defiant downfall, at once an outrage on a more than decent community, and a new interest in many admirable lives. Soon there were complaints, which I was requested to transmit to Copleston in his next lucid interval, but I only pretended to have done so. I thought the complainants a set of self-righteous busybodies, and I vastly preferred the goodwill of the delinquent. That was partly on Ronnie's account, partly for the sake of the man's own magnificent past, but partly also because his presence seemed to me a fleeting phase of sheer insanity, which would end as suddenly as it had supervened. The form was too bad to be true, even if Copleston had ever shown it before, and there was now some evidence that he had not. Delavoye had come down from town with eyes as bright as Ronnie's. You remember Sorry Biggerstaff by name? He was second for the Diamonds the second year Copleston won them, and he won them himself the year after. I met him today with the man who lunched with me at the United University. I told him we had Copleston down here, and asked him if it was true that he had ever been off the rails like this before, only without breathing a word about his being off them now. Sorry Biggerstaff swore that he had never heard of such a libel, or struck a more abstemious hound than Harry Copleston, or ever heard of him being, or ever having been anything else. So you must see what it all means, Gilly. It means that he's never got over the loss of his wife. But that happened nearly three years ago, Ronnie told me. Why didn't the old boy break out before? Why save it up for Witching Hill? I know what you're going to say. But isn't it obvious? Our wicked old man drank like an aquarium. His vices are the weeds of this polluted soil. They crop up one after the other, and with inveterate irony he's allotted this one to the noblest creature on the place. It's for us to save him by hook or crook, or rather it's my own hereditary job. And how do you mean to set about it? You'll be angry with me, Gilly, but I shan't be happy till I see his house on your hands again. It's the only chance to drive him into fresh woods and pastures new. I was angry. I declined to discuss the matter any further, but I stuck to my opinion that the cloud would vanish as quickly as it had gathered, and Copleston, of all men, was man enough to stand his ground and live it down. But first he must take himself in hand, instead of which I had to own that he was going from bad to worse. He was a man of leisure, and he drank as though he had found his vocation in the bottle. He was a lonely man, and he drank as though drink was a friend in need, and not the deadliest foe. He was the only drunkard I ever knew who drank with impenitent zest, and I saw something of him at his worst. He was more approachable than he had been before his great surrender. All October and November he kept it up, his name a byword far beyond the confines of the estate, and by December he must have been near the inevitable climax. Then he disappeared. The servants had no idea of his whereabouts, but he had taken luggage. That was the best reason for believing him to be still alive, 
until he turned up with his boy for the Christmas holidays. It would be too much to say that he looked as he had looked last holidays. The man had aged. He seemed even a little shaken, but not more than by a moderate dose of influenza, and to a casual eye the improvement was more astounding than the previous deterioration, especially in its rapidity. His spirits were at least as good as they had been before, his hospitality in keeping with the season. I ate my Christmas dinner with father and son, and Delavoye and I first footed them on New Year's morning. What was most remarkable on these occasions was the way Copleston drank his champagne, with the happy moderation of a man who has never exceeded in his life. There was now no shadow of excess, but neither was there any of the weakling's recourse to the opposite extreme of meticulous austerity. A doctor might have forbidden even a hair of the sleeping dog, but to us young fellows it was a joy to see our hero so completely his own man once more. Early in January came a frost, a thrilling frost, with skating on the gravel-pit ponds beyond the village. It was a pastime in which I had taken an untutored delight all the days of my northern youth, and now I put in every hour I could at the clumsy execution of elementary figures. But Copleston had spent some winters in Switzerland, and he was a past master of the continental style. Ordinary skaters would form a ring to watch his dazzling displays, and those who had not seen him in the autumn must have found it hard to credit the whispers of those who had. His pink skin regained its former purity, his blue eyes shone like fairy lamps, and the whole ice rang with the music of his edge as he sped careening like a human yacht. It was better still to watch him patiently imparting the rudiments to Ronnie, who picked them up as a small boy will, and worked so hard that the perspiration would stand upon the smooth brown face for all that wondrous frost. It froze, more or less, all the rest of those holidays, and the Copplestons never missed a day until the last of all. I was hoping to find them on the ice at dusk, if only I could manage to get away in time, but early in the afternoon Uvo Delavoye came along to disabuse my mind. "'That young Ronnie's caught a chill,' said he. "'I thought he would. "'It'll keep him at home for another day or two, "'so the ill wind may blow old Copleston a bit of good. "'I'm feeling a bit anxious about him, Gilly. "'Wild horses won't drag him from this haunted hill. "'Just at this moment, however, "'he's on his way to Richmond "'to see if he can get Ronnie the new wisdom, "'and I'm sneaking up to town "'because I know it's not to be had nearer.' I was wondering if you could make time to look him up while we're gone. I made it there and then at the risk of my place. It was not so often that I had Ronnie to myself, but at the very gate I ceased to think about the child. A Pickford van was delivering something at the house. At a glance I knew it for a six-gallon jar of whisky, to see poor Copleston some little way into the Easter term. Ronnie lay hot and dry in his bed, but brown and bright as he had looked upon the ice, and sizzling with the exuberance of a welcome that warmed my heart. He told me, of course, that it was awful rot, losing the last day like this, but on the other hand he seemed delighted with his room. He always was delighted with something, and professed himself rather glad of an opportunity of appreciating it as it deserved. Indeed, there was not a lazy bone in his little body, and I doubt if he had spent an unnecessary minute in his bedroom all the holidays. But they really were delightful quarters, those two adjoining rooms, for which no paper in our stock had been good enough. Both were now radiant in a sky-blue, self-colour, that transported one to the tropics, and certainly looked better than I thought it would when I had the trouble of procuring it. In the bedroom the blue was only broken by some simple white furniture, by a row of books over the bed, and by groups of the little eleven in which Ronnie already had a place, and photographs of his father at one or two stages of his great career. I was still exploring when an eager summons brought me to the bedside. "'Let's play cricket,' cried Ronnie. "'Do you mind?' "'With a pack of cards? My own invention? Everything up to six counts properly, 
All over six count singles, except the picture cards, and most of them get you out. King and Queen are caught and bold, but the old knave's Mr. Extras. Capital, Ronnie, said I. Shall it be single wicket between us two, or the next test match with Australia? Ronnie was all for the test, and really the rules worked very well. You shuffled after the fall of every wicket, and you never knew your luck. Tom Richardson, the last man in for England, made sixty-two, while some who shall be nameless went down like ninepins in the van. In the next test, at Lord's, we elaborated the laws to admit of stumping, running out, getting leg before, and even hitting wicket. But the Red Kings and Queens still meant a catch, or what Ronnie called a row in your timber yard. And so the afternoon wore on until I had to mend the fire and light the gas, and then somehow the cards seemed only cards, and we put them away for that season. I forget why it was that Ronnie suddenly wanted his knife. I rather think that he was deliberately rallying his possessions about him in philosophic preparation for a lengthy campaign between the sheets. In any case, there was no finding that knife, but something much more interesting came to light instead. I was conducting the search under directions from the bed, but I was out of sight behind the screen when I kicked up the corner of loose carpet and detected the loosened board. Here, thought I, was a secret repository where the missing possession might have been left by mistake. There were actual marks of a blade upon the floor. This looks a likely place, I said, but I did not specify the place I meant, and the next moment I had discovered neither knife nor pencil, but the soiled, unframed photograph of a lovely lady. There it had lain under the movable bit of board, which had made a certain noise in the moving, that same second Ronnie bounded out of bed, and I to my feet to chase him back again. Who told you to look in there? Give that to me this minute. No, no, please put it back where you, where you found it. His momentary rage had already broken down in sobs, but he stood over me while I quickly did as he begged, and replaced the carpet. Then I tucked him up again, but for some time the bed shook under his anguish. I told him how sorry I was, again and yet again, and I suppose eventually my tone betrayed me. "'So you know who it is?' he asked, suddenly regarding me with dry, bright eyes. "'I couldn't help seeing the likeness,' I replied. "'It's my mother,' he said, unnecessarily. His manner was curiously dogged and unlike him. "'And you keep her photograph under the floor?' "'Yes, you don't see many about, do you?' he inquired, with precocious bitterness. "'There was not one to be seen downstairs. "'That I knew from my glimpse of the photograph under the floor. "'There was nothing like it on any of the walls, "'nothing so beautiful, nothing with that rather wild, defiant expression "'which I saw again in Ronnie at this moment.' "'But why under the floor?' I persisted, guessing vaguely, though I did." "'You won't tell anybody you saw it there?' "'Not a soul.' "'You promise?' "'Solemnly. "'You won't say a single word about it if I tell you something?' "'Not a syllable.' "'Well, then, it's because I don't want Daddy to see it, for fear—' "'It would grieve him,' I suggested at the end of his broken sentence, and I held my breath in the sudden hope that I might be right. "'For fear he tears it up,' the boy said harshly, he did that once before, and this is the last I've got. I made no comment, and there were no further confidences from Ronnie. So many things I wanted to know and could not ask. I could only hold my peace and Ronnie's hot hand until it pinched mine in sudden warning as the whole house leapt under a springy step upon the stairs. Not a word to anybody, you know, Mr. Gillen? Not one to a single soul, Ronnie but it was with a heavy seal that was thus placed upon my lips, heavy as lead when I discussed the child with Uvo Delavoye, and that was almost every minute that we spent together for days to come. For Ronnie became very ill. In the beginning it was an honest chill. The chill turned to that refuge of the general practitioner, influenza. 
Double pneumonia was its last, most defiant stage. The local doctor made no mistake about that, and Copleston appealed in vain against the verdict, before specialists who came down from London at a guinea a mile. It was a mild enough case so far. The boy was strong and healthy, and capable of throwing off at least as much as most strong men. He was also a capital little patient, and Copleston a magnificent patient's father. He did not harry the doctors, he treated the elderly Scotch nurse like a queen, and he was not always in and out of the sick room by day, and he never set foot in it during the night. In the daytime Delavoye took him for long walks, and I would sit up with him at night until he started nodding in his chair. The first night he said, "'You must have some whisky, Gillen. I've got a new lot in.' And when I said I seldom touched it, "'I know you don't in this house,' he rejoined, with his hand for an instant on my shoulder. "'But that's all right, Gillen. Do you happen to know much about Dr. Johnson?' "'Hardly anything. You should try Uvo.' "'Well, I don't know much myself, but I always remember that when the poor old boy was dying, he refused the drugs which were giving him all the peace he got, because he said he'd made up his mind to render up his soul to God unclouded. Now I come to think of it, there's not much analogy, continued Copleston, with a husky laugh. But I know I'd rather do what Dr. Johnson wouldn't than go up clouded to my little lad, if ever he wanted me. And he took about a teaspoonful from a mistaken sense of hospitality, but no second allowance as the night wore on. The next night I was able to refuse without offending him. After that the decanter was never touched. Yet once or twice I saw the stopper taken out in sheer absence of mind, only to be replaced without flurry or hesitation. Self-control? I never knew a man with more. It came out every hour that we spent together, and before long it was needed almost every minute. One day Delavoye dashed into the office in town clothes and with a tragic face. "'They want a second nurse. It's come to that already,' he said. "'I'm going up about it now.' "'But isn't that the doctor's job?' I asked, liking the looks of him as little as his news. "'I can't help it if it is, Gilly. I must lend a hand somehow or I shall crack up. It's little enough one can do, besides being day-nurse to poor old Copleston.' and this afternoon he's asleep for once. What a great chap he is, Gilly, and will be ever after, if only we can pull the lad through and then get both of them out of this. But it's two lives hanging on one thread, and that cursed old man of mine trying all he knows to cut it. I'll euchre him, you'll see. My hook or crook, I'll balk him. But white clouds were tumbling behind the red houses opposite and Delavoye dashed out again to catch his train, like the desperate leader of a forlorn hope, leaving his dark eyes burning before mine and his wild words ringing in my ears. Quite apart from the point on which he was never sane, he seemed to have lost the otherwise level head on which I had learned to rely at any crisis. But Copleston still kept his, and him I admired more and more. He still took his exercise like a man, refrained from harrying nurse or doctor, showed an untroubled face by the sick bed, but avoided the room more and more, and altogether during the terrible delirious stages. "'If I were to stay there long,' he said to me once, "'I should make a scene. I couldn't help it. There are more things than one to cloud your mind, and I've got to keep mine unclouded all the time.' He kept it very nearly serene, and his serenity was not the numbness of despair, which sometimes wears the same appearance, for I do not think there was a moment at which Copleston despaired. He had much too stout a heart. There was nothing forced or unnatural in his manner. His feelings were not deadened for an instant, yet not for an instant would he give them rein. Only our sober vigils cut deeper lines than his excesses before Christmas, and each night left him a hard year older. We spent them all downstairs in his study. Neither of us was a chess player, and I was all unversed in cards. But sometimes we played drafts or dominoes by the hour, 
as though one of us had been Ronnie himself. Often we talked of him, but never as though there were any question of his eventual recovery. Copleston would only go so far as to bemoan the probability of an entirely lost hockey term, and his eye would steal round to the photograph of last year's hockey eleven at Ronnie's little school, in a place of honour on the mantelpiece, where indeed it concealed one of his most heroic trophies. Fitted and proportioned like half a hundred others on the estate, that study of Copleston's is one of those Witching Hill interiors the time cannot dismantle in my mind. It was filled with the memorials of a brilliant boyhood. There were framed photographs of four Cambridge crews, of two Eton eights, of the Eton Society with Copleston to the fore in white trousers, of the long low wall with trees behind it, and of the old grey chapel behind the trees. There were also a number of party-coloured caps under suspended oars, and more silver in the shape of cups, salvers, and engraved cigarette boxes than his modest staff of servants could possibly keep clean. Over the mantelpiece hung the rules of the Eton Society, under glass, with a trophy of canes decked with light blue ribbons. "'It all looks pretty blatant, I'm afraid,' said Copleston apologetically. "'But I thought it would interest Ronnie, and perhaps hound him on to cut me out. And now—' He stopped, and I hoped he was not going on, for this was when Ronnie was at his worst, and the second nurse had arrived. "'And now,' said Copleston, "'the little sinner wants to be a dry bob.' I have not naturally a despondent temperament, but that night I, for my part, was wondering whether Ronnie would ever go to Eton at all. The delirious stage is always terrifying to the harrowed ignoramus watching by the bed. It is almost worse if one is downstairs trying not to listen, yet doing little else, and without the nurse's calm voice and experienced eyes to reassure one. That was how I spent that night. The delirium had begun the night before, and had been intermittent ever since. But Copleston was not terrified. He kept both nerve and spirits like a hero. His thought for me brought a lump into my throat. Since I refused to leave him, I must take the sofa. He would do splendidly in the chair. He did better than I could have believed possible. He fell peacefully asleep, and I sat up watching his great long limbs in the lowered gaslight, but always listening while I watched. Ronnie had not the makings of his father's fine physique. That was one of the disquieting features of the case. He was fragile, excitable, highly strung, as I felt his poor mother must have been before him. And he was tragically like his hidden portrait of her. I saw it as often as I was permitted a peep at Ronnie. What had she done amiss before she died? That was perhaps the chief thing I wanted to know about her, but after my pledge to Ronnie, I felt unable even to discuss the poor soul with Delavoy. But she was only less continually in my mind than Ronnie himself, and to-night it seemed she was in his as well. Oh, mummy, mummy, darling, my very, very own little mummy! God knows what had taken me upstairs, except the awful fascination of such wanderings, the mental necessity of either hearing them or knowing that they had ceased. On the stairs I felt so thankful they had ceased. It was in the darkened playroom, now a magazine of hospital appliances, kettles, bottles, and oxygen apparatus. It was here I heard the joyous ravings of his loving little heart. Here, on the threshold between his own two rooms, that I even saw him with his thin arms locked round the neck of the young nurse who had taken over the night duty. She heard me. She came to the door and stood in silhouette against the cheerful firelight of the inner room. Its glow just warmed one side of her white cap and plain apparel, then glanced off her high white forehead and made a tear twinkle underneath. "'He thinks I'm his mother,' she whispered, "'and I'm letting him.' I went out and pulled myself together on the landing, before sneaking back into the study without waking Cobbleston. 
In the morning I was dozing behind my counter without compunction, for the vigil had been an absolutely sleepless one for me, when the glass door opened like a clap of thunder, and in comes Delavoye rubbing his hands. "'The doctor's grinning all round his head this morning,' he crowed. "'You may take it from me that there's a lot of life in our young dog yet.' "'What's his temperature?' "'Down to a hundred and a bit. One thing at a time. They've scotched that infernal delirium at all events.' "'Since when?' "'Sometime in the night. He's not talking any rot this morning.' "'But he was fairly raving after midnight. I went up and heard him myself.' Uvo broke into exulting smiles. "'Ah, Gilly,' said he, "'but now we've got an angel abroad in the house. "'You can almost hear the beating of her wings.' "'Is that your own, Uvo?' "'No, it's a bit of a chestnut in these days. "'But it was said originally of the angel of death, Gilly, "'and I mean the opposite sort of angel together.' "'The young nurse?' "'Exactly. She's simply priceless, "'but I knew she would be.' "'You knew something about her, then?' "'Enough to bring her down on my own yesterday and blow the doctor. "'But he's all for her now.' "'So indeed was I, for though a tear is nowhere more out of place "'than on the cheek of a trained nurse, "'yet in none is it such welcome evidence of human interest and affection. "'And there was the tender tact of the pretense to which she had lent herself before my eyes.' even as a memory it nearly filled them afresh. Yet I could not speak of it to Copleston, and to Delavoye I would not, lest I were led into betraying that which I had promised Ronnie to keep entirely to myself. Nurse Agnes, we all called her, but I for one hardly saw her again, save on the daily constitutional in a grey uniform and flowing veil. The fact was that the improvement in Ronnie was so marked, so splendidly sustained, that both his father and I were able to get to bed again. The boy himself had capital nights, and said he looked forward to them. On the other hand, for final sign of approaching convalescence, he became just a little difficult by day. Altogether it was no surprise to me to learn that two nurses would not be necessary after the second week but I was sorry to hear it was Nurse Agnes who was going, and I thought that Uvo Delavoye would be sorrier still. There was something between them, I felt sure of that. His rushing up to town to fetch her down, the absurd grounds on which he had pretended to justify that officious proceeding, and then his candid enthusiasm next day, when his protégé had shown her quality. All these were suspicious circumstances in themselves, yet by themselves, at such a time, they might easily have escaped one's attention. It was a more than suspicious circumstance that brought the whole train home to me. I was getting my exercise one midday, when there was nothing doing. Suddenly I saw Nurse Agnes ahead of me getting hers. Her thin veil flew about her as she stepped out briskly, but I was walking quicker still. In any case, I must overtake her, and it was a chance of hearing more good news of Ronnie, for we never saw anything of her at night, except in firelit glimpses through the sick-room door. Evidently these were not enough for Uvo either. Presently I espied him sauntering ahead, and when Nurse Agnes overtook him, instead of my overtaking her, he hardly took the trouble to lift his hat. But they walked on together at a pace between his and hers, while I waited in a gateway, before turning back. So that was it. I was delighted for Uvo's sake. I tried to feel delighted altogether. At any rate, he had chosen a wonderful nurse, but really I had seen so little of the girl, if that was the word for her. In the apparent absence of other objections, I was prepared for a distinct grievance on the score of age. However, she was going. That was something, and Uvo did not seem particularly cut up about it after all. But he had brought the cab for her himself when the time came. He did not come in, but I saw him through the window as I sat at drafts once more with Copleston, because it was Saturday afternoon, and Ronnie was not quite so well. This must be for Nurse Agnes, I said innocently. 
It seems a pity she should go so soon. But she's not going yet, cried Copplestone, upsetting the board. She's going this evening. The other nurse told me she was. Of course, I've got to see her before she goes. I fancy that's her cab, said I, unwilling to give Delavoy away, but feeling much more strongly that Nurse Agnes had saved Ronnie's life. I didn't hear the bell, said Copplestone. Still, I believe that's Nurse Agnes on the stairs. I had heard one creak, but only one, and the nurse was on tiptoe outside the door as Copplestone opened it. She might have been a thief, she seemed so startled. "'Why, nurse, what do you mean by trying to give me this slip?' he said in his hearty voice. "'Do you know they all tell me you've saved my little chap's life, and yet I've hardly seen you all the time. You'd always fixed him up for the night by the time I'd finished dinner, and I've been so late in the morning that we've kept on missing each other at both ends. You've got to spare me a moment now, you know.' but Nurse Agnes would only stand mumbling and smiling in the half-lit hall. I... I mustn't lose my train, was all I heard. And then I realized that even I had only heard her voice once before, and that now it did not sound the same voice. It was not meant to sound the same, that was why. I had it in a flash. And in that flash I saw that Nurse Agnes had been keeping out of our way all these days and nights, keeping us out of her way by a dozen tacit little regulations which had seemed only proper and professional at the time. But a fiercer light had struck Copplestone like a lash across the eyes, and he started back as though stung and blinded until Nurse Agnes tried to dart past the door. Then his long arm shot out, and I shuddered as he dragged her in by hers. "'You!' he gasped, and his jaw worked as though he had been knocked out in the ring. "'Yes,' she said coolly, facing him through her veil. "'And they're quite right. I've saved your boy for you. Do you mind letting me go?' I forced my way past the pair of them, and rushed out to Delavoy, waiting with the cab. "'Who is she? Who on earth is this nurse of yours?' I cried without restraint. He drew me out of earshot of the cabman. "'Has Coppleston spotted her?' "'This very minute. But who is she?' "'His wife.' "'I thought she was dead.' "'No, he divorced her three years ago.' "'Who told you?' "'Ronnie.' "'And you never told me?' "'I promised him I wouldn't tell a soul.' "'The little rascal! He had bound us both. But there was a characteristic difference as between Delavoy and me, and the feelings that we inspired in that gallant little heart. Whereas I had surprised its secret, Ronnie had confided in Uvo of his own free will and accord. And it was he who begged me to bring her Gilly when he was at his worst. He said it was his one hope that she could pull him through, that he knew she could. So I found her, and she did. She wasn't really a nurse, but she was his mother. She was his angel of life. "'Will she be forgiven?' I asked, when we had looked askance at the study windows that gave us back only the wavering reflection of shrubs and of the chimneys opposite. "'Will she forgive?' returned Uvo sardonically. "'It's always harder for the one who's in the wrong, and there's always something to be said for him or her.' "'Does she know that her husband needs to be saved as well?' "'Hush,' said Delavoy. The door had opened. Copplestone came out upon the step and stood there, feeling in his pockets. I held my breath, and the only creature who counted just then in all that road of bleak red houses and in all the wintry world beyond was the great shaken fellow coming down the path. "'You might give this to the cabby,' said he, filling my palm with loose silver. "'Just tell him we shan't want him now.'" End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Witching Hill by E. W. Hornung. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
under arms it must have been in my second year of humble office that the burglary scare took possession of witching hill it was certainly the burglar's month of november and the fogs confirmed its worst traditions on a night when the street lamps burst upon one at the last moment like the flash of cannon through their own smoke a house in witching hill road was scientifically entered and the silver abstracted in a style worthy of precious stones in that instance the thieves got away with their modest spoil it was as though they then made a deliberate sporting selection of the ugliest customer on the estate their choice fell upon a colonel arthur cheffins who not only kept firearms but knew how to use them and gave such an account of himself that it was a miracle how the rascals escaped with their lives the first i heard of this affair was a volley of gravel on my window at dead of night then came uvo delavoye's voice through the fog before i quite knew what i was doing at the open window colonel cheffins lived in the house opposite the delavoyes where he had lately started a cramming establishment on a small scale and on his rushing over the road to the rescue at the first sound of the fusillade poor uvo had himself been under fire in the fog the good colonel was in a great way about it i gathered although no harm had been done and it was only one of the pupils who had loosed off in his excitement but would i care to come along and inspect the damage then and there if so they would be glad to see me and as yet there was whisky for all comers i turned out instantly in my dressing-gown and slippers found uvo shivering in his and raced him to the scene it took some finding in the fog until the lighted hall flashed upon us like a dark lantern at arm's length in the classroom at the back of the house round the gas fire which obtained in all our houses pedagogue and pupils were still telling their tale by turns and in chaotic chorus their audience was smaller than i expected a little knot of unsporting tenants seemed more disposed to complain of the disturbance than to take up the chase but indeed that was hopeless in the fog and darkness and before long uvo and i were the only interlopers left we remained by special invitation for i had made friends with the colonel over the papering and painting of his house while uvo had just shown himself a would-be friend indeed it's a very easy battle to reconstruct said the crammer at the foot of his stairs i was up there on the landing when i took my first shot at the scoundrels you'll find it in the lower part of the front door one of them blazed back and there's a hole in the landing window i had last word from the mat and i've been looking for it in the gate but i begin to hope we may find a drop or two of their blood instead to-morrow morning colonel cheffins was a little bald man with a toothbrush moustache and bright eyes that danced with frank delight in the whole adventure he looked every inch the old soldier even in a jaeger suit of bedroom overalls and i vastly preferred him to his two young men but scholastic connections are not formed by picking and choosing your original material delavoye and i however made as free as they with the whisky bottle as a substitute for adequate clothing and the one who had nearly committed manslaughter had some excuse in his depression and remorse if i'd hit you he said to uvo i'd have blown my own silly brains out with the next chamber i'm not kidding i wouldn't shoot a man for twenty thousand pounds and he shuddered into the chair nearest the glowing lumps of white asbestos licked by thin blue flames god bless my soul no more would i cried the crammer heartily i aimed low on purpose not to do more than wing them there's my bullet in the door to say so whereas theirs fairly whistled past my head on its way through the upstairs window they're a most desperate gang of sportsmen i assure you there's certainly something to be said for keeping a revolver observed uvo eyeing the brace now lying on the cast-iron chimney-piece do you mean to say you haven't got one cried colonel cheffins i do i wouldn't keep one even out in egypt i hate the beastly things said uvo delavoye but why oh i don't know there's something so uncanny about them they lie so snug in your pocket and you needn't even take them out to send yourself to kingdom come why yourself mr delavoye 
you never know you might go mad with the beastly thing about you god bless my soul cried the colonel with cocked eyebrows you might go mad while you're shaving and cut yourself too deep for that matter or when you're waiting for a train or looking out of a window i put in to laugh uvo out of the morbid vein which i understood in him but others might easily misconstrue i could see the two young pupils exchanging glances as i spoke no he replied laughing in his turn to my relief none of those ways would come as easy and they'd all hurt more however to be quite serious i must own it isn't the time or the place for these little prejudices against the only cure for the present epidemic and yet for my part i'd always rather trust to one of my sudanese weapons with which you couldn't have an accident if you tried over the way his own rooms were freely hung with murderous trophies acquired in the back blocks of the nile but i felt more and more that uvo delavoye was wilfully misrepresenting himself to these three strangers and the best i could hope was that a certain dash of sardonic gaiety might lead them to suppose that it was all his chaff well said the colonel if those are your views i only hope you haven't many valuables in the house on the contrary colonel everything we've got over there is a few sizes too big for its place and our plate chest simply wouldn't go into the strong room of the local bank so where do you think we keep it i've no idea in the bathroom cried uvo delavoye with the shock of laughter which was the refreshing finish of some of his moodiest fits but you had to know him to appreciate his subtle shades especially to separate the tangled threads of grim fun and gay earnest and i feared that the gallant little veteran was beginning to regard him as a harmless lunatic a shake of his bald head was all his comment on the statement that moved delavoye himself to sudden birth and on the whole i was thankful when the return of a manservant with a nervous constable grabbed out of the fog by a lucky dip provided us with an excuse for groping our way across the road what on earth made you talk all that rot about revolvers i grumbled as we struck his gate it wasn't rot i meant every word of it the more shame for you if you did but you know very well you don't my dear gilly i wouldn't live with one of those nasty little weapons for worlds i i couldn't gilly not long he had me quite tightly by the hand i'm coming in with you i said you're not fit to be alone oh yes i am he laughed i haven't got one of those things yet and i shall never get one i'd rather thieves broke in and stole every ounce of silver in the place so we parted for what was left of the night instead of turning it into day as we often did with less excuse and for once my powers of sleep deserted me but it was not the attempted burglary or any one of its sensational features that kept me awake it was the lamentable conversation of uvo delavoye on the subject of firearms and that no longer as affecting other minds but as revealing his own i had often heard him indulge his morbid fantasies but never so gratuitously or before strangers to me he could and would say anything but of late he had been less free with me and i more anxious about him he had now been over eighteen months on the shelf that was his whole trouble it was not that he was ever seriously ill but that he was always well enough to worry because he was no better or fitter for work his mind raced like an engine and the futile wear and tear was beginning to tell on the whole machinery to be sure he had written a little in a desultory way but i never thought his heart was in his pen and his fastidious taste was a deterrent rather than a spur yet he railed about the bread of idleness said a man should be fit or dead and that his mother and sister would be better off without him those ladies were again from home and the fact did not make it easier to dissociate such sayings from an unhealthy horror of loaded revolvers so you may think what i felt the very next evening which i did insist on spending at number seven when the distasteful conversation was renewed and developed to the point of outrage 
daylight and less fog had failed to reveal any trace whatever of the thieves and it became evident that the colonel's moral victory he had lost a few spoons was also a regrettably bloodless one i saw no more of him during a day of vain excitement but at night his card was brought up to uvo's room and the old fellow followed like a new pin i was in those days none too nice about my clothes and both of us young fellows were more or less as we had been all day but the sight of the dapper coach and his well-cut dinner jacket with shirt front shining like his venerable pate and studded with a couple of good pearls might well have put us to the blush under his arm he carried a big cigar box and this he presented to delavoye with a courtly sparkle you rushed to our aid last night mr delavoye and we nearly shot you for your pains said the colonel pray accept a souvenir which is in your hands i hope and in similar circumstances is less likely to end in so much smoke uvo lifted the lid and the gaslight flashed from the plated parts of a six-chambered revolver with a six-inch barrel it was one of the deadly brace that we had seen on the colonel's chimney-piece in the middle of the night i can't take it from you said delavoye shrinking palpably from the pistol i really am most grateful to you colonel cheffins but i've done nothing to deserve such a handsome gift i beg to differ said the colonel and i shall be sorely hurt if you refuse it you never know when your turn may come after your own account of that plate chest i shan't lie easy in my bed until i feel you are properly prepared against the worst but my poor mother would rather lose every salt cellar colonel cheffins than have a man shot dead on her stairs i shouldn't dream of shooting him dead replied the colonel i shouldn't even go as far as i went last night if i could help it but with that barrel glittering in your hand mr delavoye i fancy you'd find it easier to keep up a conversation with some intrusive connoisseur is it loaded i asked as uvo took the weapon gingerly from its box not at the moment and i fear these few cartridges are all i can spare i only keep enough myself for an emergency i need hardly warn you by the way against pistol practice in these little gardens it would be most unsafe with a revolver of this calibre why god bless my soul you might bring down some unfortunate person in the next parish i entirely agreed but delavoye was not attending he was playing with the colonel's offering as a child plays with fire with the same intent face and meddlesome maladroitness it was a mercy it was not loaded i saw him wince as the hammer snapped unexpectedly then he kept on snapping it as though the sensation fascinated ear or finger and just as i found myself enduring an intolerable suspense uvo ended it with a reckless light in his sunken eyes i'm a lost man gilly said he with a grim twinkle for my benefit i was afraid i should be if i once felt it at my paw it's extraordinarily kind of you colonel cheffins and you must forgive me if i seem to have been looking your gift in the barrel but the fact is i have always been rather chary of these pretty things and i must thank you for the chance of overcoming the weakness his tone was sincere enough so was the grave face turned upon colonel cheffins but its very gravity angered and alarmed me and i was determined to have his decision in more explicit terms then the pistol's yours is it uvo i asked with the most disingenuous grin that i could muster till death do us part he answered and his laugh jarred every fibre in my body i never knew how seriously to take him that was the worst of his elusive humour or it may be of my own deficiency in any such quality i confess i like a man to laugh at his own jokes and to look as though he meant the things he does mean uvo delavoye would do either or neither as the whim took him and i used sometimes to think he cultivated a willful subtlety for my special bewilderment thus in this instance he was quite capable of assuming an alarming pose to pay me out for any undue anxiety i might betray on his behalf 
Therefore, I had to admire the revolver in my turn, and even to acclaim it as a timely acquisition. But either Uvo was not deceived, or else I was right as to his morbid feeling about the weapon. He seemed unable to lay it down. Sometimes he did so with apparent resolution, only to pick it up again and sit twisting the empty chambers round and round till they ticked like the speedometer of a coasting bicycle. Once he slipped in one of the cartridges. The colonel looked at me, and I perched myself on the desk at Uvo's side. But the worst thing of all was the way his hand trembled as he promptly picked that cartridge out again. We had said not a word, but Uvo rattled on with glib vivacity and the laugh that got on my nerves. His new possession was his only theme. He could no more drop the subject than the thing itself. It was the revolver, the whole revolver, and nothing but the revolver for Uvo Delavoye that night. He was childishly obsessed with its unpleasant possibilities, but he treated them with a grim levity not unredeemed by wit. His bloodthirsty prattle grew into a quaint and horrible harangue, eked out with quotations that stuck like burrs. More than once I looked to Colonel Cheffins for a disapproval which would come with more weight from him than me, but decanter and siphon had been brought up soon after his arrival, and he only sipped his whisky with an amused air that made me wonder which of us was going daft. "'Talk about bare bodkins, otherwise hollow-ground razors,' cried Uvo, emptying his glass. "'I couldn't do the trick with cold steel if I tried. "'But with a revolver you've only got to press the trigger, and it does the rest. "'Then I wonder if you even live to hear the row. "'Then, Gilly, it's a case of that big blue mark in his forehead "'and the back blown out of his head.' "'That wasn't a revolver,' said I for he had taught me to worship his modern god of letters. That was Snyder that squibbed in the jungle. Delavoye looked it up in his paper-covered copy. Quite right, Gilly, said he. But what price this from the very next piece? So long as those unloaded guns we keep beside the bed blow off by obvious accident the lucky owner's head. That's a bit more like it than the big blue mark, eh? and my gifted author is the boy who can handle these little dears better than anybody else in the class. He don't use them for moral suasion under arms, but he makes you smell the blood and hear the thunder. Colonel Cheffin seemed to have had enough at last. He rose to go with a rather perfunctory laugh, and I jumped up to see him out on the plea of something I had to say about his damaged door and window. "'For God's sake, sir, get your revolver back from him,' was what I whispered down below. "'He's not himself. He hasn't been his own man for over a year. Get it back from him before he takes a turn for the worse, and—and—' and "'I know what you mean,' said the Colonel, "'but I don't believe it's as bad as you think. I'll see what I can do. I might say I've smashed the other, but I mustn't say it too soon, or he'll smell a rat.' I must leave him to you, meanwhile, Mr. Gillen, but I honestly believe it's all talk. And so did I, as the dapper little coach smiled cheerily under the hall lamp, and I shut the door on him and ran up to Uvo's room two steps at a time. But on the threshold I fell back for an instant, as though that accursed revolver covered me, for he was seated at his desk, his back to the room, his thumb on the trigger, and the muzzle in his right ear. I crept upon him and struck it upwards with a blow that sent the weapon flying from his grasp. It had not exploded. It was in my pocket before he could turn upon me with a startled oath. "'What are you playing at, my good fellow?' cried he. "'What are you?' And my teeth chattered with the demand. "'What do you suppose? You didn't think I'd gone and loaded it, did you?' I was simply seeing, if you want to know, whether one could use one's forefinger or one's thumb. I've quite decided on the thumb. Uvo, I said, pouring out more whiskey than I intended, this is more than I can stick even from you, old fellow. You've gone on and on about this infernal shooter till I never want to see one in my life again. If you mean to blow your brains out this very night, 
you couldn't have said more than you have done what rhyme or reason is there in such crazy talk i didn't say it was either poetry or logic he answered filling his pipe but it's a devilish fascinating idea the idea of wanted suicide you call that fascinating not as an end it's a poor enough end i was thinking of the means the cold trigger against your finger the cold muscle in your ear the one frightful bang and then the great what next the great what next for you i said as his eyes came dancing through a cloud of bird's eye is cane hill or colney hatch if you don't take care i prefer the village mortuary if you don't mind gilly either would be so nice for your mother and sister and i'm such a help to them as i am aren't i think of the bread i win and all the dollars i'm raking in it would be murder as well as suicide i went on it would finish off one of them if not both he smoked in silence with a fatuous drunken smile though he was as sober as a man could be that made it worse and it was worst of all when the smile faded from the face to gather in the eyes in a liquid look of unfathomable cynicism new to me in uvo delavoy and yet mysteriously familiar and repellent yes there is certainly a drawback gillen but i don't know that they've a right to be anything more we don't ask to be put into this world surely we can put ourselves out of it if it amuses us if it amuses us but that's the whole point he cried puffing and twinkling as before how many people out themselves for no earthly reason that anybody else can see and have their memory insulted by the usual idiotic verdict they want to go at their best with all their wits about them as you or i might want to go to court if they could take a return ticket they would they don't really want to go for good any more than i do they're doing something they don't really want to do it can't help doing as half of us are half our time they're weak fools i blustered they're destructive children who've never grown up and they ought to be taken care of till they do he smiled through his smoke with sinister serenity but we are all children my dear gilly and on the best authority most of us are fools as for the destructive faculty it's part of human nature and three parts of modern policy but our politicians haven't the child's excuse of wanting to know how things are made which i see at the back of half the brains that get blown out by obvious accident good night uvo i said just grasping him by the arm i know you're only pulling my leg but i've heard about enough for one night another insulting verdict he laughed well so long if you really mean it but do you mind giving me my webley and scott before you go your what my present from over the way it's one of webley and scott's best efforts you know i had one like it only the smaller size when i was out in egypt i thought he had forgotten about the concrete weapon or rather that he did not know i had picked it up but expected to find it in the corner where it had fallen when i knocked it out of his hand my own hand closed upon it in my side pocket as i turned to face uvo delavoye who had somehow slipped between me and the door so it's not your first revolver i temporized no you've got to have one out there but you didn't think it worth bringing home i was trying to recall his very first remarks about revolvers after the burglary the night before and delavoye read the attempt with his startling insight and helped me out with impulsive candour you're quite right i did say i hated the beastly things but it was a weakness i always meant to get over and now i have do you mind giving me my webley what did you do with the other one uvo pitched it into the nile since you're so beastly inquisitive but i was full of fever at the time and broken-hearted at cracking up it's quite different now is it of course it is i'm not going to do anything rotten i was only ragging you don't be a silly ass gillen he was holding out his hand his face had darkened but his eyes blazed 
"'I'm sorry, Uvo.' "'I'll make you sorrier,' he hissed. "'I can't help it. You couldn't trust yourself in your fever. It's your own fault if I can't trust you now.' He glared at me like a caged tiger, and now I knew the wild, sly look in his eyes. It was the look of the Nello portrait at Hampton Court, but there was no time to think twice about that, with the tiger in him gnashing its teeth in very impotence. "'Oh, very well. You don't get out of this with my property, if I can help it. I know I'm no match for you in brute strength, but you lay a finger on me if you dare.' He was almost foaming at the mouth, and the trouble was that I could understand his frenzy perfectly. I would not have stood my own behaviour from any man, and yet I could not have behaved differently if I had tried, for his insensate fury was all of a piece with his delirious talk. I kept my eye on him as on a wild beast, and I saw his roving round the uncouth weapons on the wall. He was edging nearer to them, his hand was raised to pluck one down, his worn face bloated and distorted with his passion. Neither of us spoke. We were past the stage. But in the grate the gas-fire burned with a low, reproving roar. And then all at once I saw Uvo turn his head, as though his sensitive ear had caught some other sound. His raised hand swept down upon the handle of the door, and, as he softly opened it, the other hand was raised in token of silence, and for one splendid second I looked into a face no longer possessed by the devil, but radiant with the keenest joy. Then I was at his elbow, and our ears bent together at the open door. Gas was burning on the landing as well as in the hall below. Everything seemed normal to every sense. I was obliged to breathe before another sound came from any quarter but that noisy stove in the room behind us. And then it was more a vibration of the floor, behind the curtains of the half-landing, than an actual sound. But that was enough. Back we stole into Uvo's room. "'They've come,' he whispered simply. "'They're in the bathroom. Now.' I heard. "'We'll go for them.' "'Of course.' He reached down the very weapon he had meant from my skull a minute before. It was a great club studded with brass-headed nails, and also a most murderous battle-axe, so that the same whirl might fell one foe and cleave another. I had taken it from Uvo, and his dancing eyes were thanking me as he loaded the revolver I had handed him in exchange. There were three stairs down to the half-landing but Uvo sat up too late at nights not to know the one that creaked. We reached the old maroon curtain without a sound. Behind it was the housemaid's sink on the right, and straight in front the bathroom door with a faint light under it. But the light went out before we reached it, and then the door would not open, and with that there was a smothered hubbub of voices and of feet within. It was like the first shot from an ambuscade, but it was our ambuscade, and Uvo's voice ran out in triumph. "'Down with the door, or the devils do us yet!' And they sounded as though they might before bolt or hinges gave. As we brought all our weight to bear, we could hear them huddling out of the window, and somebody whispering sharply, "'One at a time, one at a time!' And at that my companion relaxed his efforts inexplicably, but I flew at the keyhole with flat foot, and every ounce of my weight behind it. The crash fined off into the scream of splintered wood, and I should have entered head foremost if the man on the other side had not stemmed the torrent of torn woodwork. Even as it was, I went down on all fours, and was only struggling to my feet as his figure showed dimly in the open window. Delavoye fired over my head at the same instant, but his revolver squibbed, like that far-away Snyder, and before I could hack with his battle-axe at their rope-ladder, the last of the thieves was safe and sound on terra firma. "'Don't do that,' cried Delavoye. "'It's our one chance of nabbing him.' And he was out of the window and swinging down the rope-ladder, while the ruffians were yet in the yard below. But they did not wait to punish his foolhardihood, 
The gate in the back garden banged before he reached the ground, and he hardly had it open when the last of the bunch of ropes slid hot through my hands. After them, he grunted, giving chase to shadowy forms across the soaking grass. His revolver squibbed again as he ran. They did not stop to return his fire, but across the strawberry bed, at the end of the garden, the high split fence rattled and rumbled with the weight of the flying gang, and there was a dropping crackle of brushwood on the other side, as I came up with Delavoye under the overhanging branches of the horse-chestnuts. "'Going over after them?' I panted, prepared to follow where he led. "'I'm afraid it's no good now,' he answered, peering at his revolver in the darkness. The chambers ticked like the reel of a rod. Besides, there's one of them cast a shoe or something. I trod on it a moment ago. He stooped and groped in the manure of the strawberry bed. A shoe it is, Gilly, by all that's lucky. You wouldn't like to dog them a bit further, I suggested. The fellow with one shoe won't take much overhauling. No, Gilly, said Delavoye, abandoning the chase, as incontinently as he had started it, but with equal decision. I think it's about time to see what they've taken, as well as what they've left. Their rope ladder was still swaying from the bathroom window, and it served our turn again since Uvo was without his key. He climbed up first, and the window flared into a square of gaslight before I gained the sill. The scene within was quite instructive. The family chest was clamped right round with iron bands, like the straps of a portmanteau, and the lock in each band had defied the ingenuity of the thieves, so they had cut a neat hole in the lid and extracted the contents piecemeal. These were not strewn broadcast about the room, but set out with some method on a dressing table as well as in the basin and the bath. Apparently the stage of selection had been reached when we interrupted the proceedings, and the first thing that struck me was the amount of fine old plate and silver, candelabra, urns, salvers and the like, which had not been removed. But Delavoye was already up to the right armpit in the chest, and my congratulations left him grim. "'They've got my mother's jewel case all right,' said he, she has one or two things worth all those put together, but we shall see them again unless I'm much mistaken. Come into my room and hear the why and wherefore. Ah, I was forgetting young Ambition's ladder. Thanks, Gilly. I hope you see how hard it's hooked to the woodwork on this side. It's only been their emergency exit. We shall probably find that they took their tickets at the pantry window. Now for a drink in my room and a bit of Sherlock Holmes work on the lucky slipper. I wish I could describe the change in Uvo Delavoye as he sat at his desk once more, his eager face illumined by the reading gas lamp with the smelly rubber tube. Eager was not the word for it now, neither was it only the gas that lit it up. At its best, for all its bloodless bronze and premature furrows, the face of Uvo was itself a lamp that only flickered to burn brighter or to be more steadily, and now he was at his best in the very chair and attitude in which I had seen him at his worst not so many minutes before. Was this the fellow who had toyed so tremulously with a deadly weapon and a deadlier idea? Was it Uvo Delavoye who had deliberately debauched his mind with the thought of his own blood, until to my eyes at least he looked capable of shedding it at the morbid prompting of a degenerate impulse? I watched him keenly, examining the thing in his hands, chuckling and gloating over a trophy which I, for one, would have taken far more seriously, and yet I could not believe it was he whom I had caught with a revolver, loaded or unloaded, screwed into his ear. It was in a silence due to two divergent lines of thought that we both at once became aware of a prolonged but muffled tattoo on the door below. "'Coppers ahoy!' cried Uvo softly. "'I thought you hauled the rope ladder up after us?' "'So I did. But how do you know it's a copper?' "'Who else could it be at this time of night? Stay where you are, Gilly. I'll go down and see.' 
and in a moment there was a new tune from the hall below. Why, it's Colonel Cheffins! How sporting of you, Colonel! Yes, come on up, and I'll tell you all about it. The Colonel's answers were at first inaudible up above, but on the stairs he was explaining that he had awakened about an hour ago with the conviction that yet another house had been attacked, that in his inability to get to sleep again he had ultimately risen, and seeing a light still burning across the road, had ventured to come over to inquire whether we were still all right. And with that there entered the Jaeger dressing suit and bedroom slippers, containing a very different colonel from the dapper edition I had seen out the other side of midnight, and for that matter but a worn and feeble copy of the one we had both admired the night before. "'That's Witching Hill all over,' cried Uvo, as he ushered him in. "'You dreamed of what actually happened at the very time it was actually happening. "'And yet our friend Gillen can't see that the whole place is haunted "'and enchanted from end to end.' "'I'm not sure that I should go as far as that,' said the Colonel, "'sinking into a chair, while Delavoye mixed a stiff drink for him in his old glass.' In fact, now you come to put it that way, I'm not so sure that it was a dream at all. I sleep with my window open at the front of the house, and I rather thought I heard shots of sorts. Of such a sort, laughed Uvo, that you must be a light sleeper if they woke you up. Do you mind telling me, Colonel, where you used to keep those cartridges you were kind enough to give me? In my washstand drawer. I hope there's nothing the matter with them they wouldn't go off that was all god bless my soul cried colonel cheffins putting down his glass the caps were all right but i am afraid you can't have kept your powder quite dry colonel i expect you've been swilling out that drawer in the heat of your ablutions devil a bullet would leave the barrel and i tried all three but what an infernal disgrace cried the colonel shuffling to his slippered feet why, the damn things ought to go off if you raise them from the bottom of the sea. I'll let the makers have it in next week's field, libel or no libel, you see if I don't. But that won't console either you or me, Mr. Delavoye, and I can't apologize enough. I only hope the scoundrels were no more successful here than where they were at my house. I am afraid they didn't go quite so empty away. God bless my soul! Those cartridge makers ought to indemnify you. But perhaps they left some traces. That was the worst of it in my case. Neither footmark nor fingerprint worth anything to anybody. I am afraid they left neither here. But you don't know that, Mr. Delavoye. You can't know it before morning. The frost broke up with the fog, you must remember, and the ground's as soft as butter. Which way did the blackguards run? through the garden and over the wall at the back into that they must have left their card this time said colonel cheffins ten years younger in his excitement and even more alert and wide awake than we had found it the night before he did not conceal his anxiety to conduct immediate investigations in the garden but uvo persuaded him to wait till we had finished our drinks and we got him to sit down at the desk trembling with keenness you see, said Uvo, leaning forward in the armchair and opening a drawer in the pedestal between them, one of them did leave something in the shape of a card, and here it is. And there lay the cast shoe in the open drawer under the colonel's eyes and mine as I looked over his shoulder. Why, it's an evening pump, he exclaimed. Exactly. Made by quite a good maker, I should say all in one piece without a seam i mean i see i hadn't noticed that but then i haven't your keen eye colonel you really must come out into the garden with us i shall be delighted and we might take this with us to fit into any tracks precisely but there's just one thing i should like you to do first if you would said uvo deferentially and i bent still further over the colonel's shiny head "'What's that, Mr. Delavoye?' "'Just to try on the glass slipper, so to speak, Colonel Cheffins, 
because it's so extraordinarily like the one you were wearing when you were here before. There was a moment's pause in which I saw myself quite plainly in the colonel's head. Then, with a grunt and a shrug, he reached out his left hand for the shoe, but his right slid inside his Jaeger jacket, and that same second my arms were around him. I felt and grabbed his revolver as soon as he did, and I held the barrel clear of our bodies while he emptied all six chambers through his garments into the floor. Then we bound our fine fellow with his own rope ladder, reloaded both revolvers with unexpurgated cartridges discovered upon his person, and prepared to hold a grand reception of his staff and pupils. But those young gentlemen had not misconstrued the cannonade, and it was some days before the last of the gang was captured. They were all tried together at the December sessions of the Central Criminal Court, where their elaborate methods were very much admired. The skillful impersonation of the typical army coach by the head of the gang, and the adequate acting of his confederates in the subordinate posts of pupils and servants, were features which appealed to the public mind. The taking of the house in Mulcaster Park as a base for operations throughout a promising neighborhood was a measure somewhat overshadowed by the brilliant blind of representing it as the scene of the first robberies. It was generally held, however, that in presenting a predestined victim with a revolver and doctored cartridges, the master thief had gone too far, and that for that alone he deserved the exemplary sentence to which he listened like the officer and gentleman he had never been. So the great actor lives the part he plays. It is a perquisite of witnesses to hear these popular trials with a certain degree of comfort, and so it was that I was able to nudge Uvo Delavoye at the last soldierly inclination of that bald, bad head before it disappeared from a world to which it has not yet returned. "'Well, at any rate,' I whispered, "'you can't claim any Witching Hill influence this time.' "'I wish I couldn't,' he answered in a still lower voice. "'But you've just heard that our bogus colonel has been a genuine criminal all his life.' "'I wasn't thinking of him,' said Uvo Delaboye. "'I was thinking of a still worse character who really did the thing I felt so like that night before we heard them in the bathroom. "'Not a word, Gilly. I know you've forgiven me. "'But I'm rather sorry for these beggars, for they came to me like flowers in May.' and as his face darkened with a shame unseen all day in that doleful dock, it was some comfort to me to feel that it had never been less like its debased image at Hampton Court. End of chapter 6